There we are. So yeah, again, welcome. Uh, thank you for attending. Um, as Luke introduced me correctly, my name is Johnny. Um, he didn't pronounce my last name, which is probably a good thing. It's Hoibergs, it's uh, Dutch, and it's actually a Dutch word. Uh, and if you're English, uh, it translates to haystack for some reason. Uh, so it's going to be Johnny Haystack if you're English. Um, today I will talk about uh, Microsoft Q-Sharp and Azure Quantum. Um, just like Luke mentioned, indeed, um, I'm a, I'm a dot .NET uh, .NET consultant for a Belgian firm called Involved. Um, Microsoft Q Sharp and Azure Quantum is not something that I use professionally, uh, but about two years ago, I saw a presentation from uh, a guy from Microsoft about the new Microsoft Q Sharp. Maybe it's already three years ago. Um, and the thing that I remembered was that, oh, it, there's so many things to talk about when doing quantum. Uh, and I had a very hard time um, grasping what it was all about and that's why i decided to spend some time in my free time uh, to, to try to figure out what what's it's all what it's all about and basically i wanted to do a better job in explaining this to people who have no idea what what uh, quantum computing and microsoft q sharp and azure quantum is all about so my goal for tonight is to give you a, a, an introduction a 19 minute introduction um, about quantum, Microsoft Q-Sharp and Azure Quantum, and then you will still need to put in some effort and time yourself to really dig deep and, and, and really fully understand uh, what it's all about. And that is perfectly normal. Um, I'm also a Microsoft MVP um, in software development uh, technologies, um, so not specifically to Microsoft Quantum, but to the .NET um, world. Um, and I, was, I, I have talked uh, in these past few months with Microsoft uh, people that work on the Q-Sharp and Azure Quantum team. And they all told me that like it's it's perfectly normal that quantum is something very difficult to comprehend. Um, and we fully understand uh, that people need time. Uh, and basically, it's, it's a new technology. We will all still need to learn a lot. Uh, and even the people who work with that day to day and, and really um, people who are very smart, people who have PhDs in, in uh, quantum physics and stuff like that, quantum mechanics, um, they still have some issues grasping the full uh, potential of what uh, quantum computing in, in the quantum world can provide us. So again, don't be scared if, if, if some of the things that I try to explain are not fully um, fully clear to you. Um, just let it come over you and uh, try to have some have some fun with it. Um, because it's a virtual thing, I can't see you guys. Uh, you can see me. I feel very awkward like this. Um, I'm trying to do this a little bit more uh, interactive. So I've, I'm using a, a website called Slido, or however you pronounce it. Um, and it's a, it's a little tool that you can use to ask me questions. Um, and if you ask me questions during the presentation, um, I, I will try to answer them while I'm presenting. I think it's always more interesting and more interactive that I can uh, answer your questions immediately instead of waiting until the end of the presentation. You can join this Slido session for this specific presentation um, by scanning the QR code on your smartphone and then joining uh, the web page on your smartphone. And then you can easily ask uh, some questions. You can also go to slido.com and then enter the hashtag .net to the core um, to join the same session. Um, I will also try to use this session to ask you guys uh, some questions, um, if I have any. Um, and every slide in my presentation will also have this QR code. So if I'm going too fast right now and I skip to the next slide, don't worry, the same QR code you will find on the top right corner of every slide. So you will always be able to join. I have multiple screens here at my home desk. So I will open the Slido page also on my second uh, monitor so I can uh, look at it and I can see when you are asking uh, questions. So let's uh, let's dive into what I'm going to talk about. Yeah, um, just uh, an obligatory slide. This again is my name. I'm a Microsoft MVP, blah, 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 blah. Um, but importantly, more importantly, when you have questions after tonight, um, doesn't matter if it's about quantum or about .NET in general, you can always contact me uh, using my Twitter account at Jonike. Uh, my GitHub account, uh, I have lots of uh, example code on my GitHub account. By the way, uh, in the bottom of my presentation slides, you will also have the full link of a .NET, uh, I'm sorry, of a GitHub repository containing 
lots of examples in Q Sharp and for Azure Quantum um, that you can you can use as as reference. So if you want to play around with Q Sharp, just visit that GitHub page specifically for this talk tonight, um, and uh, you can you can find lots of information there. But you can also contact me using my GitHub account. And then finally, uh, my professional email address uh, at involvedit.be, the company I work for. But you can also uh, send me a little email if you have questions or remarks. Um, I would very much like that. Uh, because this gives me a little bit of feedback for this virtual session tonight, so I don't feel so lonely and so awkward. Uh, so thanks for that. Um, maybe it's going to be 90 minutes. Uh, normally these sessions last for one hour, but I specifically asked Luke to, to get a little bit more time because basically I have four, five, six hours of content and I want to tell you as much as I can. Um, I'm going to try to do it in 90 minutes. I'm not going to, to, to push five hours of content into 90 minutes, but I, I really need 90 minutes to, to explain uh, the, the most basic things for you uh, to, 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 to start with quantum computing. Uh, and I have prepared a little agenda for tonight. So first I will do a little bit of uh, theoretics about why um, why you should do quantum computing or why we as a human species should look into quantum computing. Uh, I will talk to you a little bit about quantum mechanics and eh? quantum computing is based on, on certain aspects of quantum mechanics. So I will talk to you about superposition and entanglement, which are the two most important concepts of quantum mechanics that we are going to use uh, in quantum computing. And then I will talk about classical computers versus quantum computers. We will talk about bits versus qubits, eh? bits being the classical concept of a bit, zero or one, and a qubit, the quantum counterpart of a bit, zero or one, or something in superposition. I will talk to you in more detail about what quantum state actually means. So zero or one can be your classical state, but in the quantum world, there's so much more. And this is what we call a quantum state. Um, and then I will, in the second part of my uh, presentation tonight, I will go into a little bit more hands-on, uh, hands which is Microsoft Q Sharp, uh, programming languages, language from Microsoft specifically for quantum programming um, and quantum simulation on your local machine. And so quantum Q, uh, Microsoft Q Sharp is a language that can run actual quantum algorithms on actual quantum computers, but it can also run your quantum algorithms on your local machines if you have enough resources to do that. Um, after we had this introduction into that programming language, I, I can talk to you about quantum concepts like entanglement, quantum entanglement and teleportation. Um, and then finally, we can have a look into the preview of Azure Quantum. So Microsoft in the beginning of 2021 um, uh, created Azure Quantum as a, as a public preview. Um, so we can actually use quantum in the cloud thanks to Microsoft um, since the beginning of this year. And then if we have some time left and you guys uh, are not sick of me, uh, we can actually look into an existing algorithm um, that I think is very is interesting and I think is the, the, the easiest algorithm to, to grasp the power of, of, of quantum uh, computing. Uh, it's still a little bit funky, um, but it's, it's, it's a very cool thing. So if, if time permits, we will have a look into that. Um, so before I go uh, to that, let's go back to Slido. So this is the, the homepage for Slido. You can, you can still join. Um, and I can click a little button right here that will ask you the question, what made you join this session? So I'm, I'm, I just want to know why are you here? Um, this can maybe help me uh, in the next few minutes to know what I should talk about more. Because I, like I said before, I have four or five hours of content, but I can, uh, I can do like, uh, I can pick some things and I can talk about 10 more if, if that is uh, what you guys uh, like. So I will leave this up like this for a couple of minutes while I, while I continue with my presentation. So please let me know uh, why you are here. Um, I want to start the why of quantum computing with my own experience when I was uh, littler. <laughs> when I was a teenager, uh, I was in school uh, and I was already very interested in, in software development in programming because I wanted to be creative, but I was kind of lazy. I didn't want to create complicated stuff. I just wanted to sit in a chair with a computer and I wanted to, to do creative stuff, but in a lazy way. So that's why I basically decided to, to become a software developer. Um, but I was already doing this uh, in, in high school. 
And one of my teachers uh, came up to me after I did an exercise. Which, it, was a, it, it had nothing to do with, with IT. I think it was a mechanical drawing class using AutoCAD on a, on a PC. And I was done with my exercise and the teacher came to me and he said, I know you're into programming. I have a fun little exercise for you. And um, at that time, I didn't know, but today I know. The exercise he proposed to me was called a night's tour. And on the left-hand side, um, you can see an image of a chessboard, and on that chessboard you can see a, a knight's piece. A knight's piece, represented by a horse, uh, is a chess piece. You can move around the chessboard by using a horse jump. Uh, and this horse jump is very specific. It's like two positions uh, horizontally and, and one position vertically, or, or two positions vertically and one position horizontally. So the, all the different uh, steps you can take are basically eight different uh, ways. So you can see those eight different steps you can take with the, the, the small dots on the chessboard. And the teacher told me, write a computer algorithm that basically starts at a random location and jumps around the chessboard using a horse jump. And you need to try to visit all of the squares exactly once, not twice, once. Uh, he said, this is possible, but you're going to need some trial and error. Um, so I started programming like a, like a mental kid. Uh, I was really into programming at that age. So I started like doing some recursive stuff. Okay, if I take a jump and I have, uh, I just go to a random location. If that location is still free, I'm doing another jump to another random location. If that is free, and so on and so on and so on. If I if I get stuck somehow, uh, the next jump is not possible because all of those eight locations are already visited or outside of the grid. I need to backtrack. And so I need to do a step back and, and try something different. So that is something you can do with a recursive algorithm. So I programmed it. Uh, after a couple of hours, I thought I was finished. I pressed the start button. Um, I think it was Turbo Pascal that I was using by, uh, back then um, in, in, uh, in a DOS environment. So I started the application and it ran. It ran for seconds, it ran for minutes, it ran for an hour, and I got sick and tired of waiting. Uh, and I thought I made a mistake. So I tried to fix my mistake, but nothing really helped. The, the algorithm never really gave me an answer. Uh, there was one time where I, where, I, um, where I let it run overnight. And then in the morning, it was still searching for a solution. And I thought I was just a stupid kid. Uh, I went outside to play with my friends. Uh, and basically, I abandoned the problem. But then uh, when I was a lot older, when I was already uh, at work, like professionally, um, I learned about this problem again. Then I knew it's, it's called a, the night tour. And basically, it, it's very difficult for us to comprehend because there's only 64 squares. But if you write a computer algorithm that makes the wrong decisions all the time, it can basically run for thousands of years without finding a solution because there's so many possibilities. There's so many different possible paths you can take that don't that will not give you a solution that will that will be stuck some way or another um, and that is still today very difficult for me to comprehend a computer today is very powerful just let it run for a couple of minutes and it should find these kinds of solutions right well the answer seems to be no there's so many algorithms out there that when uh when when enough variables are added to the problem uh, a, a classical computer or even all the classical computers in the world combined cannot solve these kinds of problems. Um, this is not the best example, but for me, it was the most, um, the most cool example, the coolest example, because basically there are, there are uh, ways you can solve this problem on a classical computer very easily. If you, for example, stay uh, close to the outside walls of this chessboard, um, if you program that into your algorithm, it will find a solution uh, quite quickly. But again, if you make the wrong decisions by accident, it can run for many hundreds or even thousands of years without finding a solution. Uh, and that basically uh, is the idea where quantum computing starts. There are so many problems uh, in the outside world that are so complex that we still cannot solve today. And that's why we are searching for other ways of computing that can hopefully help us to do that. And the rest of the night, I will talk to you about quantum computing and why quantum computing can actually help here. So let's go back to Slido. Uh, and I can see that most of you are here out of curiosity to learn more. You're curious about uh, the theory and the concept of quantum computing. Some people even want to know if they can use it in their uh, current line of business applications. Uh, and some people really have something like, whoa, quantum computing, it's, it's a hype. I really want to know more about it. So very cool. Okay, thank you for that. 
Um, I'm going to uh, ask you immediately a second question. As I said before, I have four or five hours of content and I only have 90 minutes. So as the last question I'm going to ask you before I really go into my presentation, do you want me to spend most of my time on the theory and, and, and show you a little bit of, of practical Q sharp code? Or do you want me to spend a little bit more time on the practicality? So do you want me to, sh to show you more code, dive deeper into the code, into the Q sharp, maybe let it run on, on Azure Quantum? Or do you, do you just don't care, you're bored, you're here because there's nothing else tonight? Um, just let me know and then I can, uh, I can see how I can uh, I can help you guys. So, if we need to know about quantum computing, we really need to know about quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics, uh, I can tell you, start your evening using YouTube, type a search string about quantum mechanics, and be surprised and be overwhelmed with lots of things that you will not understand. So it's 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 a crazy world out there uh, with quantum. Um, so it's very difficult and there's so much content out there. And, and basically I had the same experience. Um, tonight I'm going to try to keep it to the basics uh, and, and for quantum computing specifically, um, we need the concepts of superposition and a little bit entanglement. And these are the, the two these are the two most important concepts of quantum mechanics that we will use to actually create quantum computers that can help us significantly. Um, so first, we, we can start with superposition. Um, on the left-hand side, uh, there's a little image of three balls with weird little arrows. Um, this is a, a graphical representation of a, a, a property of an electron. An electron, you all know, uh, an electron, the very small particle, which is part of an atom, an atom has a core, and inside of the core you have the, the protons and, the, and the, it's the nucleus, whatever, I, I can't uh, exactly remember, and then uh, around that are spinning a bunch of electrons, depending on which molecule, there's a, a different number of electrons and stuff like that. Um, if you take only this one electron, it can have a property. And that property, for example, can be the spin of that electron. It's not something that we can visualize. It's not something that we can really see. It's something that we can theorize about. So like the spin of an electron, we can represent it in this image and it can be in two distinct values, basically. It can be up or it can be down. And like it, it can spin clockwise or anti-clockwise or up or down, it doesn't really matter. We just take this as a representation of a property of a quantum object. Um, superposition actually means that we don't know if, the, if the, the property is spinning up or spinning down. It's somewhere in between. And basically, in, in just normal language, there's not really a way that we can describe it. At the, uh, up and down at the same time is not correct. Something in between, it's not correct. The idea of superposition is that at that moment in time, it is just unknown if the spin is going to be up or down. And unknown does not mean that we don't know, even the universe doesn't know. The, the actual particle itself is not spinning up, it's not spinning down, it doesn't even know itself. It's, yeah, again, it's somewhere in between, but that's not really correct. Uh, language is, is, is a problem here. I cannot really describe to you what it means because we don't have the language for it uh, in English then. Um, so, but, but it is still okay to say, okay, let, let's say they are up and down at the same time. So that's what superposition is, is all about. But this only works on, on, on the quantum level. What is the quantum level? It's a very small scale. So like an electron or an atom um, is a small scale. It's a quantum scale. And these kinds of things happen at that scale. So quantum superposition ha really happens at that scale. We cannot see it, but we can... Uh, we can we can do experiments and we can measure it based on that. And a very creepy thing about this superposition is that if an electron's spin is in superposition of up and down, um, we cannot even measure that because the moment you measure it, uh, for example, if you use a measurement device to actually measure that, it will immediately collapse. That's what they call that, collapse to either up or down. So the universe at that point makes a decision because you are taking a measurement. You are asking, electron, are you spinning up or spinning down? And then the universe makes a decision, uh, let's say it's up, and then you measure up, but you cannot me measure the uh, superposition itself. And that's why the superposition is uh, probabilistic. When you basically do an infinite amount of measurements on different electrons, you will get a 50% spinning up and a 50% spinning down. So the superposition of that spin is a probability of it spinning up and down. 
Uh, and based on experiments, we can really see that they were not spitting up or down beforehand. No, they were only making that decision the moment we took the measurement. The only thing in the macroscopical world where we live in that I can that I can relate to, it's like a USB device. If you have a USB device or a USB stick, whatever, I don't know if I, no, I don't have anything around, but just a USB device. If you try to plug that into your computer, it will never fit. Uh, you, you know what I mean, eh? your laptop is somewhere uh, far away and you're reaching uh, your, your arm, you're trying to plug in some USB, you're, you're turning it around 50 times, it doesn't really fit. You look at the slot, why is it not working? Um, and then when you look at it, you can see, okay, this is the way it's oriented, and then you plug it in, and then it works. So for me, that is kind of what superposition is. Eh? When you don't look, when you don't measure, it's it's up or down at the same time, or, or, or none, none of the, the two, whatever. And then when you look at it, when you take a measurement, then the universe takes a decision based on some probability. Okay, the alignment is up, and then you can slot it in. So that's basically what superposition is all about. Again, in a, in a few minutes, I will talk about um, why that can be of benefit to us when we talk about quantum computing. And then on the right-hand side, even something that is more funky is what we call entanglement. Um, and entanglement means when you have two quantum particles, for example, two electrons, and these electrons have that spin up or spin down property, and they are in superposition, so they are up and down at the same time, <laughs> um, they can even be entangled or we can force them to be entangled. And entangled actually means that if we measure only one of them, so we look at only one of them and it decides to be spin up, for example, then the other one that was entangled with this one will immediately take the same decision, but it will be in the opposite uh, state. So if the state of the, the measured uh, quantum particle, in this case an electron, um, is up, then the other one will immediately collapse to down. Uh, so that's very weird. Uh, and there's many experiments on that that really told us that it works. It is exactly like that. There's even a, a crazy experiment with a satellite that's orbiting Earth, uh, like 100 kilometer, kilometers in the sky. There's a satellite. They are using um, photons. So I'm using electrons as an example, but a photon, for example, can also have a property that can be in superposition. For a photon, one of these properties is the polarization, uh, horizontal or vertical polarization of a photon, which is a basic particle of light, and light is a wave. Um, so if they created a device on this satellite that is able to split a photon in half, and if you split a photon in half, you get two photons of half the energy, and they have a very high probability of being entangled because they originate from the, from the same uh, photon. And then they use laser beams to send a bunch of these entangled photons to one laboratory in, in China and another uh, laser beam to send the other half of the entangled uh, photons to a laboratory in, in Europe somewhere. It's in uh, Austria. Um, and then they do measurements and they can see that, that this actually works. They can see if they measure it in China, the, the one in, in Austria collapses to the opposite position immediately. They also uh, discovered that there's no time difference. It happens immediately. And that's the reason why they are, they are testing this over such large distances, China, Austria, because they really want to measure, because basically we don't understand how it works. Are these particles communicating somehow? No, they are not communicating because it, it really happens instantly, so faster than light, and nothing can go faster than light. So what I'm basically saying is, I don't understand how it works. It just works. Experiments told us that it works, uh, but even scientists don't know how it works. They have different kinds of theories. They say, some people even say there's wormholes involved, involved stuff like that, but that's just fancy talk for, I have no idea what's going on. Um, so very cool stuff that we also want to leverage uh, using quantum computers. And because we know it's real, we know it's there, we know it can happen. We can also use it in quantum computers today and it works, so very cool. Um, basically, your mother will tell you, if you don't know how it works, please don't use it. But in this case, we're using it. Um, and then again, why, why, why do we need stuff like this? Well, basically, as I told you before, some of the problems that we have today, um, they are very complicated. Um, and we cannot solve them on, on classical uh, computers. Uh, here in this example, I'm tr talking about drug development when we're developing drugs to help people to, to, um, uh, to uh, cure diseases. 
um, it is very hard. And that's basically the reason why we still do animal testing for that, because we don't have the computing capacity to fully simulate the human body. Um, if you talk about things like gene sequencing and protein folding, for example, the only reason why we have programs that you can install on your PC to help solve issues like protein folding for cancer research and, and as many people in the world as possible are trying to do these things simultaneously on their PCs is just because we don't have supercomputers that are that are capable to solve these problems fast for us. And even when we install software like 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 these at home kind of things uh, on all of the computers in the entire world, we still don't have nearly enough uh, processing power to actually solve these problems. Um, and it's basically the, the concept of superposition that we want to leverage to solve these problems. Because the reason we cannot solve these problems on classical computers is because these problems are exponential in nature. Um, if you look at a, a classical CPU, for example, um, a classical CPU has billions of transistors inside. A modern CPU has billions of transistors inside. If you want to double the power of a CPU, you need to double the amount of transistors inside, or you need to have two exact copies of that CPU. And that is not something that you can scale exponentially. If your problems get exponentially more complex, you need to have exponentially more transistors or exponentially more uh, CPUs in the world. And that is something today that we just cannot do. Um, if it takes thousands of years to solve a problem, by just doubling the amount of processing power, we still have thousands of years to solve that problem. That's not something that can help us. And then with superposition, and I will talk to you about this a little bit later with some practical examples. Um, because we don't just have one and zero, we also have that probabilistic state somewhere in between. We can try to leverage that and also create an exponential power inside of our computer system. And when our computers can be uh, exponentially increased in power, that can hopefully help us to also solve these exponential problems. Other kinds of problems we, we want, really want to solve with this is stuff like machine learning and artificial intelligence. Because for machine learning and artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence to really be um, impressive, we need to basically emulate the human mind. Uh, when you look at something, your mind takes decisions very quickly. And the, the, the way the mind works is also something that we don't fully comprehend because basically the mind is also quantum by nature. The power inside of our mind, the power inside of our body, it's all quantum mechanics. The, the way stuff works inside of your body is quantum mechanic, mechanics. Stuff inside of your body is always in superposition uh, and we just don't understand how it works. And now with quantum computing, we are trying to do our own thing by just leveraging all of those stuff that we already know from quantum. Um, so yeah, we hope that Basically, when you have so many variables inside of your problem to, to make the correct decision, you need uh, exponential amount of processing power and hopefully quantum computers uh, can do this for us. And then something that is a little bit less of an issue, but it's, 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 it's hyped, um, is security. And today we, we, we basically create stuff that we know we cannot solve. Uh, for example, public private key encryption. The reason that that works is because we just created a problem that is exponential in nature, that is just too difficult to solve on classical computers, and that can help us to secure stuff. Uh, the, if, you, if you really dumb it down, uh, the way public private key encryption works is that you take two extremely large prime numbers, just two very large prime numbers, and you multiply them together to get an even larger number. Basically, the very large number that you get as a result is your uh, public key and the two separate prime numbers is your private key. When you have the private key, you can decrypt data when you have the two separate numbers. From your private key, you can very easily create a public key. You just multiply those two numbers together. That is something that computers today can easily do. Uh, but when you only have the public key, so the very large resulting number, you cannot go back to the two individual prime numbers because today we don't have algorithms that can factorize very large numbers into its original prime factors um, because it's an exponential problem. You can try to uh, multiply all the prime numbers in the world together until you by accident find your big number. Um, but that will take again thousands of years because that's an exp exponentially complex problem. And a lot of people today are telling, oh, when quantum computing becomes a thing, we can break public private key encryption. 
easy. Um, we still don't have uh, quantum computers today that are nearly as powerful enough to to solve this problem. So again, we are still at very early stages. We're still learning. We're still creating. Um, so we don't have to be afraid of that in the like first five or 10 years. And maybe when it becomes a thing, there's already other things that we can do um, to get around this problem. So don't, don't, uh, don't get too excited about that. Let's go back to Slido. So what should I focus on? So it's, it's about 50-50. Yeah? Most of you want to, want to uh, talk about the theory. Uh, I'm sorry, most of you want to, to do some more time on live coding, but also 40% of you want to do uh, some time on, on the theory. I already spent some time on theory, but I will do a little bit more then. Uh, and I will also spend, uh, so I will do a 50-50 about theory and and some uh, some examples. I've got many examples, don't worry about that. Uh, and also 13% wants to have their mind blown. Well, minds will be blown, so very cool. Finally, uh, before I go into a little bit more detail uh, and stop yapping about all of these uh, concepts, uh, there's one big important question that remains. Uh, I know that lots of you are already thinking about that, but if we have quantum computers, if quantum computers are really a thing and they, they, are, or they are already today, not very powerful, but some of them already exist, but if we have them today, can we run crisis on them? because crisis is basically the benchmark for all of our computing. Um, well, the answer is yes, if it's powerful enough, um, but that's not, the, that's not the thing that I want to talk about with this. Um, the thing that I want to talk about is that quantum computers will probably be very specific to quantum problems. Uh, when we create quantum computers today, the only reason we want to use them is for very specific problems that we cannot solve on a classical computer. There's already a, a model designed for quantum computing. Uh, the, the whole model of how a quantum computer um, should actually work, it's, it's already a couple of decades old. It's from the uh, late 80s, beginning 90s. Uh, so it's, it's about, how old am I? Um, it's about 30 years old already. Um, and, and we are still using those same concepts concepts from 30 years ago today. All the math, all the physics, everything that we um, created in the quantum computing world is 30 years old and we are still using that today. But it's only been a few years that we are actually able to create the physical devices that can run code that way. Um, so that's what's new about quantum computing. And that's also the reason why today there's so much hype around quantum computing. Again, the theory is quite old, but today we have the physical devices, albeit they're quite small and we can only use them for conceptual things. We cannot really solve real world problems yet today, but hopefully in five years or 10 years or 20 years from now, we will be able to create uh, physical quantum computers that are powerful and stable enough to, to finally help us solve these problems. But that doesn't mean that today we can already uh, start to learn about it. If a quantum computer is powerful enough and it has enough quantum bits, um, then basically the model is compatible with classical computer computers. That's the reason why I'm talking about this crisis stuff. Um, because that means that we can also run classical algorithms on a quantum computer. I just don't know if it's going to be useful um, because the quantum computers today are very expensive. They need very specific situations. They need to be cooled down to absolute zero in temperature. Uh, they, they, that's why they take lots of uh, power, like uh, electrical power. Um, it's very difficult to keep them stable. If you have uh, if you have quantum particles and you force them into superposition, well, the universe is very chaotic by nature. So there's constant influence from the outside world. There's radiation from space, there's air, there's pressure, there's temperature. All of these things will cause your superposition to collapse because when particles get in touch with other particles, they are basically measured. Superposition will collapse to uh, whatever. Um, so it's very difficult to keep that stable. And that's why we need to to create environments that can actually give us this perfect um, uh, void of, of all of the things that can interact with it from, from the universe to put something in superposition and keep it in superposition. Quantum computers today um, can only keep particles in superposition for microseconds or, or maybe milliseconds. But it's, if your algorithm takes five seconds to run, 
it doesn't work because your particles will lose their superposition and and it will just not work so it, today it's not stable enough we, we are really working uh, working on that um if i look into um into the compute the computing model itself uh, you all know that classical computers they work with bits but today as a software developer we don't we don't think in these terms we don't think about bits we think about programming languages and frameworks and 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 creating modules and classes and and methods and 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 and, and uh, web technologies. Uh, so we already have a very high layer of abstraction when we're creating computer programs. But like in the bare metal, we are still doing bits and bit logic. Um, and when we look at uh, quantum computers today, um, we are going to do the same thing, but unfortunately, we are still very much in that phase where we still talk about bits and operations on those bits. Um, and of course, Microsoft with uh, programming languages like Q Sharp is trying to um, to to put these layers of abs abstractions on top of that. But first, we need to get down uh, all of the basics, and then we can build on top of that. So, whatever I'm ex explaining to you today, most of that will be like the bare metal um, uh, logic of circuits and operations uh, and gates. And that's where we are today with uh, quantum computing. So again, classical bits can be zero or one. We can combine bits to represent data. A combination of zeros and ones can combine all kinds of data. When we look at the quantum world, it's exactly the same thing. And that's the cool thing about quantum. Um, you don't really have to learn entirely different stuff. Um, we still have the concept of bits. Um, the notation is a little bit different. And we can still combine bits to represent data. Again, the notation is a little bit different. Um, if you are reading about computing and quantum computing, you will see this uh, Dirac notation very often. Basically, it's a vertical line, then your bit state, and then a, a like greater than sign. It's not really a greater than sign. It's a mathematical counterpart of greater than. It's not the same thing. It's another character. You can find it in the, Uni in the Unicode table. It's another character, um, but it's the math mathematical representation of a, uh, a quantum state. And why are we doing this? Well, basically, if you're reading uh, something, you have to know, is this going to be quantum or is it going to be classical? And that's the way to uh, make a distinction between those two. So if you see these funky little uh, signs, like vertical and greater than, you know, okay, this is quantum. So I'm in the con context of a, of a quantum uh, world. Now, things become interesting and I'm very sorry for this. Don't be, don't be afraid, don't be offended. Um, I really sucked at math when I was doing school. When I was doing university, uh, I had a very bad time with mathematics. I really hated it because it was too abstract to me. Um, but two years ago, when I started looking into quantum uh, computing, I saw all of this math and I was afraid. Uh, I, I even hesitate to say that I was crying a little in a little corner. Um, but now, two years afterwards, I'm very happy that math exists. And now I finally understand what math is all about. As I told you before, the English language cannot help me to represent the concept of superposition. But mathematics is a different kind of language. And it is a language that can really help me to do all these things. So I'm going to throw a little bit of this math at your face. Some of it you will understand. Some of it you will not understand. But don't be offended. Don't be afraid. Um, later on when you really want to dig into uh, quantum computing you're going to need it and it's it's actually quite simple because now you have a practical something where you can use it in a practical way and that really helps me to to understand what the mathematics is all about uh, and again i can really assure you the mathematics is not so hard you just have to bite through it uh, and you will see that all of the things you learned in school will come back and you will have something like ah now i understand what this is all about <laughs> so basically um, the quantum state where uh, a quantum state can be zero or one or a superposition of zero and one can be represented in mathematics by using two factors, like some alpha factor and some beta factor. Uh, and these factors, um, together they are what we call a, a linear uh, linear combination of zero and one. And so I told you it's not zero and one at the same time. It's not um, zero or one. It's a linear combination of zero and one. And that's a mathematical language. And what, that, what does that mean? If we translate that back to English, 
Um, it actually means that alpha and beta describe some kind of probability um, that says if we take a measurement of this uh, quantum bit, then we have an alpha probability that it will collapse to zero, and we have a beta probability of it collapsing to one. The values alpha and beta are not a percentage, it's not 100% or 50%, it's something else, but we can easily translate that into a percentage. Uh, if you take a look at the second formula that says that the absolute value of alpha squared plus the absolute value of beta squared equals one, then this one is your 100% probability. And so there is a 100% probability and we need to divide that probability amongst the zero and the one state. Um, and this is the formula to do that. So whenever you're really trying to understand uh, a quantum algorithm that is using quantum superposition in, for its advantage, um, you can really write these linear combinations down and you can start to calculate with that. Again, with classical computing, it's very easy. You have your gates, your not gate, your AND gate, your OR gate, and you can basically do that from the top of your head. We all know that one and one, and we put an AND gate in between that the result is one. It's not, not difficult to do. But if you're starting with these probabilities and, and alpha can be one over square root of two and beta can be one over square root of two, if you start calculating with that from the top of your head, you need to be a little bit of a math genius. So that's why we need to write that down and we need to calculate with that um, more, more thoroughly. Um, so that's why all the mathematics are basically needed. Um, and then to make things uh, entirely complicated, very sorry for this, um, but that's what mathematics is all about, I guess, um, is that alpha and beta are not just real numbers. No, they are complex numbers. Um, so. Very cool. Again, why complex numbers? Well, basically mathem mathematicians, when they cannot solve a problem, they invent new kinds of math um, to, um, to basically solve their problems. And for quantum mechanics, and quantum mechanics, by the way, is already more than 100 years old. So quantum, mecha quantum mechanics is something from the early 1900s. So more than, uh, it's about 100 years old. Um, we already had the concept of complex numbers then, uh, and we really need complex numbers to describe all of the quantum world uh, in mathematics. So we really need that also for quantum computing. But let's uh, shut up about that. I'm going to go a little bit quicker over this. So if you have a perfect 50-50% superposition, you will see stuff like this, one over square root of two. Why one over square root of two? It's a very weird number. It's a real number. Um, but. Uh, if you think about the formula from before, the absolute value of alpha squared plus the absolute value of beta squared, well, one over square root of two squared is one over two. Um, so it's a half. So it's a half zero and a half one. And for us, that's very comprehensible. Comprehensible. Huh? Half zero, half one is 50%, zero, 50% one. That's a perfect superposition. Um, so to recap, uh, classical bits can be zero or one, quantum bits can be zero or one, but now the power of quantum computing comes from the superposition, where we can have a linear combination of these uh, zeros and one. Uh, alpha and beta in this linear combination are complex numbers to, to blow your mind. Um, and of course, the value is known after measurement based on those probabilities of alpha squared and beta squared. If you if you're thinking, why do we take the absolute value if we're going to square the number, think about complex numbers again. The absolute value of a complex number eliminates the, the imaginary part of the complex number, and then you, the result will be a real number, and then you can square the real number. That's the, the reason why the absolute value is there. So it's not because a minus can be a positive thing, because that already happens with the, with the squared. So again, that's all the math. I'm not going to go into detail, but that is something that you will learn when you uh, dig a little bit deeper. Now, also when you're talking about quantum states and you try to understand quantum algorithms in Microsoft Q-sharp, you really have to try to visualize the quantum state of your quantum bits. Um, and in school, I learned a lot of linear algebra and matrices and vector spaces and stuff like that. And I had no idea what people were talking about. Um, I just uh, got through my exams barely, um, but now I really comprehend uh, what it's all for or what you can use it for. Basically, when your qubit has a state, it can be zero or one, or it can be a linear combination in, in between those two uh, or of those two. Uh, zeros and one states. Um, but 
if you want to represent that in linear algebra, you can basically design a, a vector space for that, and you can basically draw a vector within that vector space. And this is a, a very visual example of that, and it's what we call the block sphere. And the block sphere um, is something to visualize a single qubit state. And it's basically a vector that originates uh, in the middle of an x, y, and z axis, and that points somewhere on this sphere surface. Uh, this sphere has basically a, a distance from the center point of one, so it's a unit vector, it's a unit vector of length one, and it can be wherever on this uh, sphere's surface. Uh, and basically when it points up the z-axis, so when the vector is straight up the z-axis, it is in state zero, and when it points straight down the z-axis, it's in state one. And that's the only discrete states zero and one. All of the other positions within that sphere, so uh, you can see here uh, a qubit state psi, which is an arbitrary uh, superposition state, um, is a superposition state, as I told you. Um, but this vector can be all over the place. And these are all kinds of different superpositions. Uh, and this you can basically describe with those two complex numbers, alpha and beta. They can describe the, 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 the location, the position of this vector within that vector space. Um, and this is how you can see that these probabilities are basically the distance that this vector needs to travel towards that zero or one vector. And so this vector is in an arbitrary uh, quantum superposition state, but as you can see, it is closer to being straight up than it is to being straight down. So it has a higher probability of collapsing to zero than it does to one. So why the hell am I telling you all of this? What, what do you need to know about that? Well, basically when we are creating quantum algorithms, um, we are going to try to describe our problem within these states. And because these states are so broad, uh, we have a superposition state, we can work with probabilities, we can try to put our problem within these, a combination of these states. When we have multiple states, we can put all of the different solutions to our problems in a combination of these states. And then we are going to try to fiddle with these probabilities. And we're going to force our problem to have a higher probability for our solution and a lower probability for everything that is not our solution. Uh, when we have multiple solutions, for example, and we only want one solution because that's the correct solution and all of the other solutions are, are the, a bad solution, we want to try to change these probabilities. That is something you can do with, uh, if you heard about Fourier transforms and quantum Fourier transforms, that's basically a device that we can use um, to force these probabilities. A very stupid example can be, um, it's not a stupid example, I'm sorry, a very easy example to comprehend that you can actually put into a, a quantum uh, algorithm is when you have uh, a, a sort of database that has multiple entries um, and you are searching one specific entry um, and that entry will be the correct solution and all of the other entries that you're not searching is the wrong solution. In quantum computing, we can create uh, some kind of algorithm that basically puts all of these entries inside of a quantum state, a combined quantum state of multiple qubits. Uh, and then we can use, we can use this uh, quantum Fourier transform to, um, to make the probability of the, the item that we are actually searching higher and the probability of all the items that we are not searching lower. And we already have implementations for that on a, on a small scale that really show us that the, the time complexity for this kind of algorithm is square root of n, where n is the amount of items that we, that we are searching and the amount of items in your database. Where in a classical algorithm, in worst case scenario, uh, you need to visit all of the items because when your item is the last item, um, you need to visit all of them. So the time complexity for that is n, where the quantum counterpart square root of n is very clearly the more performant one. So that's already a, a proof that quantum computing can really help us by changing these probabilities. Um, if I continue a little bit more, a little bit further down the line, I can show you this power. A two qubit system, for example, uh, if you put two qubits together and you look again at the probability formula, you now have four distinct values, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So you have four probabilities in a perfect superposition sta combined state of two qubits. You have a 25% chance of all of these states. But when you just add a single qubit to your system, you now have eight probable states. You have eight of these values. So you now you can, if you 
think about the database. With two qubits, you can represent four items. With three qubits, you can represent eight items. With only four qubits, you can represent 16 items. And this is where that exponential power in quantum computing comes from. Remember what I told you before, in classical computing, when you want to double the processing power, you need to double the CPU transistors. In quantum computing, when you want to double the processing power of your quantum computer, you only need to add one qubit. That's like adding only one transistor to your already existing CPU to double the power of that CPU. And again, that's where the power of quantum computing comes from. So I'm going to shut up now about all the theoretics. I hope you understand a little bit where, where again, the premise of quantum computing comes from. If you want to know more, you really need to dig a little bit into the mathematics and the theory behind it. Um, you will basically see that creating quantum algorithms is creating circuits like classical circuits, putting bits through gates, AND gates, OR gates, uh, exclusive OR gates, stuff like that. Um, in quantum computing, we're doing the same thing, but we're basically fiddling around with the probabilities of superpositions. Um, and as you can see here, there's something called an X gate, a Y gate, a Z gate, an H gate, a C naught gate, and all of these gates will just rotate that vector around within that vector space to change, to fiddle around with those probabilities. Um, and then, you can create circuits like this. Um, for, for example, in quantum computing, creating qubits that are, that, that are entangled is quite easy. You only need an H gate and a C naught gate. Uh, what the hell is that? Well, an H gate, an Hadamard gate, is basically a gate. When you put a qubit through an H gate, you put it in superposition or you take it out of superposition. So if it's in state zero, that's what you can see here. This qubit is in state zero. When you put it through an H gate, now it will be in a perfect 50-50% superposition state. Um, and then we have a second qubit that's also in state zero. And then we put both combined qubits through a, a, a C naught gate. And a C naught gate is a controlled not gate. So basically the top part is the not gate. It will put the top qubit through a not port, an X gate in, a, in the quantum world. And that basically makes a zero into a one or a one into zero, something that sounds familiar, right? But the bottom part of that uh, two qubit gate is a control uh, part. And that control part is actually kind of an if statement. It basically says, if the bottom qubit is one, then I will flip the top qubit. But if the bottom qubit is zero, I will not touch the top qubit. So the top qubit will re re remain zero if the bottom one is zero, and the top qubit will become one if the bottom qubit is one. But the bottom qubit is in superposition because we put it through the Hadamard gate. Uh, so it's in a 50-50 uh, superposition state. And if we do something like this, I think it becomes very easily to comprehend that now the top qubit doesn't really know what to do because it's dependable on the bottom qubit, dependable and tangled. So it's entangled. So these two qubits are now entangled. When you take a measurement of either of these two, the other qubit will immediately get the same state. It's a little bit weird and, and uh, confusing. In the actual quantum mechanical world, entangled qubits will always have the opposite state. But in quantum computing, we, had a, we added a layer of extra extraction on top of that that says, OK, if we, if we entangle qubits together and one collapses, the other one collapses to the exact same state instead of the opposite state. But you can, you can just create a, 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 an, an additional X gate to, to do the other way around if you need that. Um, but it's, it's a little bit different than the, the quantum mechanical world. So if I measure the bottom one, the, the top one automatically becomes one if this is one or zero, if the bottom is uh, zero. So again, it's very, it's, it's a little bit harder to, to, to do from the top of your head, but if you use the mathematics and the linear algebra and the matrices, you can basically just do mat matrix multiplication because your quantum state can be described as a matrix uh, vector and your, um, your gates can be described as a, as a, as a, as a, as a matrix, I'm sorry. Uh, and then when you want to apply one to the other, you just multiply matrices together and you have the result. So again, as I told you, the math is not complicated. It just looks complicated because people and math, it's like, what the, what the hell, um, blah, blah. There's a, something different like teleportation, but I'm just going to show you teleportation uh, in Q-sharp. That's going to be a lot cooler. So let's open Visual Studio Code. Ba -bum.
I can see that there's uh, already questions. I'm very sorry. Uh, I was I was too enthusiastic. Um, so let's let's first go to um, to Slido. So what does one alpha beta represent in quantum computing? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that. So if you can uh, help me with that. So why a sphere and not a circle, or why are complex numbers needed? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, so indeed. Um, you can actually dumb it down, and you can only work with uh, with um, with uh, real numbers, and just use a circle. And that's what I do most of the time when I'm really trying to 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 work with something uh, that is that is that is easy. Um, because when you have a circle, you can use trigon trigonometry to uh, calculate probabilities. Uh, when your vector on a, on a circle needs to collapse to either the x or the y axis, you can just do like sine and cosine stuff to just uh, to just uh, figure out what the probabilities are. So that's very easy to to work with. Um, but basically, this does not cover all of the different situations that we can have in the quantum world. And this is something that comes from quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, if we really want to describe all of the things that we see from our experiments, we, we, we don't have enough with only uh, the circle and real number representation. We really need that sphere and th three dimensions. And the reason we have those three dimensions is, of course, because we have two complex numbers. And if you have the combined, the linear combination of two complex numbers, then you have three dimensions if you want to visualize it. Um, I can't really go into m too much detail, um, but it's the same thing. Why did mathematicians invent complex numbers? Because they had problems they cannot solve otherwise. In quantum, it's the same thing. As a human species, we observe things from our experiments and we invent the mathematics to describe what we observe. And that's what all that's what that's the reason we need it, because there's so many different kinds of probabilities that we need the complex numbers to describe all of them. Um, that's the that's the only reason. Um, somebody says, cool, it feels like using vectors in Unity HoloLens development. Yeah, <laughs> that, uh, but it's something completely different. But of course, when we think about uh, vectors in, in three-dimensional space, um, that is also something that we do in, in game development. So alpha is probability to be in state zero, beta is probability to be, to be in state one. What is one minus the alpha minus beta probability of placeholder? Very sorry, I think we need to discuss this uh, because I still don't really, uh, well, basically, as I told you before, alpha and beta is, is not a probability. Um, it's it's that value that fits that formula, uh, alpha squared plus beta squared. So I don't really know what else to call it. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, very, I'm, I'm not very, uh, I don't really know what you mean by that, but we can discuss uh, afterwards. Okay, so let's go back to my presentation. No, back to Visual Studio Code. By the way, I am not a mathematician. I don't have a PhD in quantum uh, mechanics. So some stuff I just know uh, because I've used it in to, to try to understand quantum computing, but to actually dig deep into the why, uh, sometimes for me is, is, is also very obscure and too obscure to really comprehend. So in Visual Studio Code, um, you can actually create .NET applications, as you know, uh, and Microsoft created a language called Q Sharp, which is basically built on top of .NET, you don't really need to install .NET on your quantum computers. Q Sharp is a language on its own. But if you want to test your quantum algorithms on your local computer, um, you really need um, you really need .NET to run that. Uh, .NET basically runs the simulator, and then the simulator runs your Q Sharp code and simulates it on your local machine. So instead of doing .NET new, which is creating a new .NET uh, application, I can use a template called Q Sharp or not, Q sharp, please, 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 please. Okay, let's try that again. Uh, Q sharp, create new project. That's the one that I wanted. In Q sharp, um, there's, today there's a couple of things that you can do. You can create a standalone console application. A standalone console application um, is, uh, something that you can run as a console on your local machine and test what whatever you're doing if you're not using too many qubits because your local processing power needs to be enough. Um, but you can also push that to Azure Quantum and, and Azure Quantum can then run that in a simulated environment on the cloud or on an actual physical quantum computer. And that's the second two things that you can see. Uh, you can see quantum application targeting Honeywell backends and IonQ 
backends. And then there's quantum library. That's the same thing as we know in .NET. You can basically have an executable that can run in a simulated environment, or you can create a quantum library that will be packed into a DLL file, and you can reuse that DLL file in multiple projects. So Microsoft is really going the, the .NET way with that uh, to create um, extensible components in your quantum programs that you can easily use in multiple uh, projects. You can even do quantum unit testing to test if your qubit states are actually what you think they are. Um, these two quantum applications targeting Honeywell backends and IonQ backends, I will come back uh, to that in, a, in, a, in, a, in like 15 minutes or so uh, when we look at Azure Quantum. But today I can just do a console application. Basically, you, you just uh, pick a random folder uh, on your local PC somewhere here, give, give your thingy a name, open your project, and that's it. This is what Q Sharp looks like. Um, it has namespaces like we know in, in .NET. It can open or use other namespaces if we need stuff from those namespaces. These are the standard uh, quantum Canon and quantum or Canon. I don't know how to pronounce this in English. Um, and quantum intrinsic, uh, intrinsic namespaces and those namespaces provide you with those quantum gates that I was telling you about, uh, like an H gate and X gate and so on. And then you have operations. An operation, a quantum operation is a part of a circuit. I, told, I, I showed you the circuits before, like the, the lines with the different gates and the qubits. This is what we basically do in, in, in Q sharp. Um, and in this case, this say hello um, operation is the entry point of my console application. So this is where my console application will be started. If I open my terminal, I can now run this on my local PC by just doing .NET run, because basically it's a .NET simulated environment that can run this piece of Q Sharp code. So I'm going to let that uh, do its thing. And I'm just going to show you an already existing um, quantum program that I prepared. So this just says, hello, quantum world to the console. If you run this on a physical quantum computer, nothing's going to happen because there's no console on that quantum computer and we're not really using any qubits. I just wanted to show you um, the, sorry, I can't do two things at once. I just wanted to show you what the project in QSharp looks like when you create a new one. So this is an already existing one. And this is basically the, the teleportation circuit from, from before. In quantum computing, while you look at this code <laughs> in quantum computing, a very important concept is that you cannot copy states. That's, that's also something that comes from the quantum mechanical world. In the quantum mechanical world, there's something that's called the no cloning theorem. You cannot clone the state from one quantum object to another quantum object. It doesn't work like that. In uh, classical computers, we can just copy data from one uh, state to another state. But in quantum computing, that doesn't work. So basically, if I go back to the slides and you look at this circuit, the top qubit has some kind of arbitrary superposition state. Let's say that that is the message. And then there's two qubits for Alice and Bob, which are a messenger and a receiver. Alice is the messenger, Bob is the receiver. And basically, Alice wants to give the message to Bob. That's what teleportation uh, is all about. But in quantum computing, you cannot just copy the value of X or the state of X on top of uh, uh, the qubit from Bob. There's, there's no way to do that. The only thing you can do in, in, uh, in, in quantum computing is teleportation. And the cool or not so cool thing about teleportation is that when you teleport data from one qubit to another qubit, it will destroy the original state and actually, when you think about science fiction and teleportation, that's exactly what happens. If we would be able to have teleportation in real life and we have these chambers, like in the movie The Fly, uh, and you put a human being into a chamber and you want to teleport it to another chamber that is somewhere else, you, you, you can immediately see that in the first uh, chamber, that human will disappear and it will appear in the second chamber. So we're not taking a copy. No, we're teleporting him from one or her from one location to the other. So the original one is destroyed. And this is the same thing that happens in quantum teleportation. Um, also, you really have to keep in mind that teleporting yourself will probably not be so very cool if you're really going to to do some philosophy around that because the original you is going to be destroyed and there's going to be a new version of you that's going to be created from scratch. So basically it's not the same person, it's another person 
but it just has all of the exact same properties. And that's also the, the thing for quantum computing. If we look at the qubit from Alice, it is an it has some kind of superposition state. This what this circuit actually does is that it entangles Alice and, and, and Bob's qubits. So we have the two qubits for these people. Um, th those are going to be entangled, and that's this first part of the circuit. Maybe you remember from my previous example of entanglement. First, you put Alice's qubit through and had a mark gate, and then you use the C not gate to entangle both qubits. Um, and what we do then as a second step is we also entangle the message to Alice's qubit. And then we do some weird stuff. We put the message through an Hadamard gate for some reason. Um, and then Alice will measure her qubit. She measures her qubit, the one that was in the initial zero state. And if that qubit measures to one, it has some probability of measuring to one. So sometimes it's going to be one, sometimes it's going to be zero. It's entangled with the message. So it's going to be based on whatever the message was. Um, when it's one, Alice is going to tell Bob, Bob, put your qubit through the X gate. Uh, and then Alice is going to uh, measure the message. And this is where the message gets destroyed. The message was an arbitrary uh, superposition state. When you do a measurement on that, the superposition state collapses. So it destroys the original state. And if that re returns a one, Alice will tell Bob, put your qubit through the Z gate. So what happens is that Bob's qubit is entangled with Alice, uh, and then he puts it through the X gate or not, and then it puts it through the Z gate or not, depending on what, what Alice told him. And then for some magical reason, that exact superposition state with those two complex numbers, alpha and beta, whatever those were, um, will be magically transported to Bob's qubit, and then the original message will be destroyed. And with the theory of quantum computing and quantum mechanics, because these two qubits are entangled, it doesn't really matter where Alice and Bob are located. If Alice and Bob are at the same location and they entangle both of their qubits together, and then Bob takes an airplane to the other side of the world and he takes his entangled qubit half with him, and they are at the other, other side of the world, they are separated. If then Alice decides to entangle with the message, do this procedure and take pick up the telephone and call Bob. Bob, put your qubit through the X gate, but not through the Z gate or the other way around or through both gates, depending on what she measured. Bob's qubit will now have the teleported state from that message. And the only thing that we used was the telephone. And the only thing that Alice talked about on the telephone was two bits, one or zero, and again, one or zero. So two bits of data through a telephone line or through the internet or to whatever, translate into that complex superposition state that has these two complex numbers that's being teleported from the message qubit through Bob's qubit, which is magical. Um, and this, is, this actually works when you are able to keep those two qubits entangled for a long time. Um, and this is actually the premise of what quantum internet could be. When we have quantum internet, we can teleport complex data um, over a quantum uh, distribute, distributor or whatever we can create that is able to hold these qubits. So that's that's already something for the future, but that is all based on this teleportation stuff. And if you look at Q-sharp, um, Q-sharp can actually um, do a similar thing because in Q-sharp we have all the, the, the tools to create a circuit. This, for example, is my teleportation circuit. And I'm just going to go to the quantum uh, version of this. So this is a, an operation called teleport qubit, and it takes a message qubit. So the message is the source of the message that I want to communicate. By the way, if you go back to the top, this is the message that I'm preparing. And I'm not preparing a 50-50 superposition or a zero or a one. I'm just using some mathematics to say, rotate the qubit state around the y-axis in that three-dimensional uh, block sphere, that three-dimensional vector space, and rotate it around the y-axis with two pi over three radians. And this basically translates to a 25-75% uh, division in probabilities. So instead of 50-50, we now have 25-75. Um, and when this message comes in, I'm going to use Q-sharp and I'm going to assign two new qubits, so three qubits in total. I'm going to um, uh, 
and not copy, I'm just going to assign my message qubit to a qubit that I'm going to call Q message. So this is by reference. So I'm not copying any values. This is by reference. So I have a qubit called Q message. I have a qubit called Q Alice, which is the first qubit in this new registry of qubits that I've created. And I'm going to have Q Bob, which is the third qubit. So now I have three qubits called Q message, Q Alice, and Q Bob. Um, this is something cool, very cool in Q Sharp. When you're trying to learn about quantum computing, and you're simulating your quantum program on your local computer, you can do debugging and you can basically bump the quantum state to a text file on your local machine. And this can help you to look at that quantum state, to look at the mathematics behind, to really help you to understand how it all works. So you can basically ignore this for the actual algorithm. And then we do the same steps as in that circuit that I showed you earlier. We first entangle Alice's and Bob's qubits by putting Alice's qubit through the H gate and Alice and Bob's qubit through the C not gate. And it's just calling methods and, and, and doing parameters. So H with the parameter Q Alice puts Q Alice's qubit through the H gate. And for C not, it's the same thing. The first parameter is the control uh, qubit and then the second parameter is the target qubit. Then we do the same thing for entangling Alice's and the message qubit, C not H, and then we do some measurements. Alice measures her own qubit, and if the result from that measurement equals one, so very, very careful here, it's not true or false, it's a very quantum state kind of thing, it's one or zero, it's a constant one or zero, built-in results, literal, uh, so if Alice's qubit is one, then we will put Bob's qubit through the X gate, and then we measure the message. If that message equals one, we put Bob's qubit through the Z gate. We do again some diagnostics to text files to see what happens with the actual state. And then Q Sharp really likes us to reset all the states to zero after our teleportation is done. And now when you open these text files, and basically you can run this on your local machine, no problem. It runs in a couple of seconds. Then if we look at the message before state, this is a text file that contains the actual state. And here it says the wave function for qubit with ID zero. So there's one qubit. It can have two states. It can either be zero or it can be one. And here you can see those two complex numbers, alpha and beta. So it's 0.5 plus zero I alpha or zero and 0 0.866025 plus zero i. So you can see that in this case, we're not using the, the, the complex or the Im imaginary part of our complex numbers. And this translates to a 25% chance of collapsing to zero and a 75% chance of collapsing to one. If I look at Bob's qubits before, you can see that it is in that initial zero state. It's 100% chance of collapsing to zero. Um, but then if we go to the end of our circuit and we do Q message after, you can see that our our original message is destroyed. It has collapsed to the zero state with 100%. So the original 25-75% uh, is now gone. But if you look at Bob after, now for some reason, Bob's qubit has that exact same state of 25% zero and 75% one. So the teleportation circuit works. Very cool stuff. Now, to um, end our presentation, tonight, um, I want to discuss Azure Quantum, because now I'm just running these, um, these things on my local computer. And the reason that it works is because for a couple of qubits, it's, it's, not, it's not hard to, to just um, to simulate, because the only thing we need to store in memory is those uh, linear combinations of those values. And again, as I told you, three qubits will become 16 complex values. You can store that in memory uh, with no issue. Um, but each time you add one single qubit, you need double the amount of memory to store those values because you need double the amount of states that you that you can store. Um, and that can become uh, quite, quite uh, difficult very quickly. Um, and actually, I tried it before. I'm not going to show you right now. But uh, some time ago, I did an upgrade to my computer and I upgraded my laptop to have 32 gigabytes of memory. And this becomes very uh, visible when you have, I think if I remember correctly, if you have 27 qubits in Q sharp, it will uh, have around 20 gigs of memory usage. And then if you add one qubit to that, you will see your memory usage going in my case to 32 gigs, and then your application crashes because there's not enough memory to store that qubit state because it, we just added one qubit. So I can do 27 qubits, but I cannot do 28 qubits on my local machine. 
Um, now, Azure Quantum is a cloud environment, so you can basically do whatever you want. It's not infinite in power, but it has lots more power than a, a local laptop. Um, and then Microsoft decided to partner with uh, multiple uh, external vendors and say, okay, we want to create a platform, Azure Quantum, and we want to um, open up the world to use your physical quantum computers. Microsoft themselves is working on a physical quantum computer, but they are not yet ready. They are using a very specific approach and they're still in their investigation phase, in their uh, experimental phase, so it's not yet working. But other companies like IBM, for example, they have their own cloud environment and they have their own already available quantum computers in the cloud. But there's also other vendors like IonQ, Honeywell, QCI, all all companies that are actually building physical quantum computers, and some of them are working with Microsoft through Azure Quantum. So here you can see, for example, that Microsoft is working on a topological kind of quantum computer. And to be honest, I have no idea what that means. Um, then IonQ and Honeywell, they are working on ion traps, quantum computers, and I will try to explain what that, what that is all about. And then QCI, just like IBM, they are using superconducting. Uh, quantum computers. So as, as I said before, topological, I have no idea what that means, um, but ion traps, um, the idea basically is that ions are kind of particles. It's, it's not an electron, it's something different, it's an ion. An ion can have a, 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 an electromagnetic charge and they are using those to represent a qubit and to put that in superposition. Uh, there's, there's multiple options to choose from in the quantum world. Uh, you can use photons, for example, um, uh, to, to rip and, and the, 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 what, I, what, what did I to, uh, tell you before? The um, uh, polarization of, of light to, to use as a, as, a, as, a, as a quantum object. But in this case, they use ions and they use um, laser beams from the outside world, laser beams to actually change those quantum states. If we put a, a, a qubit through an H gate, they are using laser beams to change the, that state very carefully. Uh, and that seems to work. QCI, for example, they are using electrons and microwaves. So they are using electrons um, in, a, in, a, in, in a vacuum in absolute zero temperature, and they are using microwaves to change the states of their qubits. And so every company is trying their own thing because as i told you before we are still in a very experimental phase we're trying to create physical quantum computers that are stable and today by using these quantum mechanical things we are able to do it for a low amount of qubits so we can we have quantum computers that have five qubits or 10 qubits or even 20 50 100 qubits but when we really need to go to um thousands of qubits, it really becomes very unstable and we cannot use it for more than a couple of microseconds. So that really doesn't help us for, for real uh, world problems. But the cool thing about Azure Quantum is that it's already available today. If you want to learn about uh, quantum, you can just write algorithms, you can read them from a book, you can learn from the internet, you can try to do some Q sharp that will help you to understand and you can actually run them on physical quantum hardware by using Azure Quantum, or Azure Quantum also provides simulated en environments. Um, and actually the way that Microsoft is doing this is uh, very similar to how .NET works. Uh, .NET runs by using a runtime on your PC. So your PC has a piece of software, the code you write is being translated into an intermediate language, as Microsoft calls it. This intermediate language is not really machine code. It's kind of a platform independent, low level code that needs to be just in time compiled by your runtime. And depending on where your runtime runs, a Linux machine, a Windows machine, an ARM processor architecture, or an x64 processor architecture, it gets compiled just in time. And Q Sharp as a language works in the same way. Q Sharp is our high level language that will be compiled down into quantum intermediate representation. So queer or queer or whatever, <laughs> QIR. Um, and this will basically be sent to those vendors. So this QIR will be sent to IonQ's um, quantum computers or, or QCI's quantum computers, and they will do the final step. They will create the runtime that translates the, the, the QIR code into actual machine code for their specific machine. 
and then that will yield some result and then that result will be communicated back to us through azure quantum so very interesting if 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 for example uh, google uh, has a new quantum computer available and they also want to make that available through Azure Quantum. I don't know if that's ever going to be a thing, but if they want to, they, the only thing that they need to do is create some translate, some, some compiler between QIR and their physical uh, machine code. So uh, let's go to my browser and I, I, will, I want to very quickly show you what that looks like. So in Azure Quantum, I have too many windows open. In Azure Quantum, you can create uh, many resources, as you know, like web applications, databases, virtual machines, even uh, a whole bunch of software as a service uh, stuff. But now you can do something like Quantum. And if you search for Quantum, you will find Azure Quantum. And Azure Quantum is kind of an, an uh, it's, 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 it's bridging all of these quantum concepts within what they call a workspace. So Azure Quantum will create for you a workspace. So you will click Create. Just like you know from Azure, you will put that under a subscription, under a resource group. Uh, you will give it a name. You will put it in a region. But I think today only the East US is available because like the physical quantum computers are also only available in the US for now. Um, and then you need to add a storage account to that. Why a storage account? Well, we basically need the storage account to store the intermediate uh, Q Sharp applications that we that we try to push to our uh, quantum computers, and we also use that to store the results that get that get translated back to us from those uh, quantum computers. So you you are obligated to create a storage account for that. Um, if you do it, um, let's see if I can quickly show you what the wizard looks like. I don't care what it's what it's named. Uh, and let's say I should have a storage account. Probably, yeah, there. Um, I can choose a number of providers. For some reason, it's not working today. Uh, it's still a preview. Sometimes it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, sometimes it does. For some reason, now it doesn't work. Um, this has a list of all the providers you can choose from. Uh, so there's there's the providers I told you about, QCI, Honeywell, uh, IonQ, uh, but Microsoft also has their own simulated environments and stuff like that. So you can just click and drag, I need this provider, this provider, and this provider, and you can go ahead and create your uh, quantum workspace. I already created one beforehand, so I can uh, show you that one. So this one, this is my quantum workspace, and I, I have my list of providers right here. So you can see that I've chosen IonQ as a physical quantum computer, and I have uh, chosen Microsoft QIO as an optimization platform. And so QIO stands for Quantum Inspired Optimization. So it's, it's running quantum algorithms, but not on a quantum computer. Um, it's running them in a quantum inspired optimization uh, world because some of our problems can already be solved if we just think quantum, but run it on a classical uh, uh, system. Um, I will show you an example uh, in just a few minutes. If we look at IonQ and their real quantum computer, for example, if I go back to my Visual Studio code and I'm closing it down, I'm opening another example, this one. Uh, this one. So this is uh, a very simple operation that ent entangles two qubits. But I'm not going to do the 50-50 entanglement. I'm again going to do the 25-75% uh, entanglement. Uh, and this can actually run on a physical quantum computer. And how can I do that? Well, first of all, um, you can actually add to your project file an execution target. And this will help you during development because some quantum computers have some restrictive uh, things in place. So for example, on, on IONSQ, uh, quantum computers, there are some operations that you cannot use from the from the library, from the base class library. And other quantum computers have other things that you cannot do. So the the, the tools and uh, the programming language will really help you with that. Huh? It will give you an, an, like an error, like a red squiggly that says, okay, you're targeting IonQ and IonQ does not have support for this gate or for this operation. So in our case, this simple entanglement circuit should work. And the thing that I really need to do right now, and I'm going to cheat a little bit um, with that, uh, is you can use your terminal here. 
and you can uh, log into your Azure subscription. So let's see what happens if I do that. This is just using the, the Azure CLI, the Azure tools for PowerShell. So now I'm logged in and now I can show my Azure Quantum Workspace spaces that are available in a table. So I have one that is successfully provisioned. So I, I should be able to use this. And I am now inside of the folder that contains this Q Sharp application. If I do LS, you can see that this contains my program.qs, my Azure Quantum Ion Q C Sharp project. So it's a little bit weird that it's called a CS project from C Sharp project. I think they will change that in the future because it's not C Sharp, it's Q Sharp. Um, but you can see that that is my project. And now you can run that on a quantum computer by executing it in your Azure environment. So Azure Quantum Execute, and I'm going to choose for the target IonQ Simulator. IonQ has its own simulator. I can also do QPU, Quantum Processing Unit, to run it on an actual quantum computer. Um, you can try that at home. Um, and I have to warn you, it will cost you some money, uh, unfortunately. Um, IonQ will cost you about $3,000 per hour. Uh, per hour processing power. Um, running this algorithm will only take a fraction of a second, so it will it will cost you uh, less than one euro or less than one pound or whatever. Um, so it's not that expensive, but it will cost you something. Um, it will also take some time. It will take a couple of hours be before it gets executed because we have long waiting lines because everyone in the world is trying this stuff uh, and the the quantum hardware is, is only that, and it needs to process all of these requests. So it will take some time. But, but to show you, I can run it on their simulator. So if you do that, it will push your Q Sharp application to Azure Quantum Workspace. It will translate it into that uh, quantum intermediate representation. It will be sent to the actual physical quantum computer. It will run your application. It will uh, send the results back to Azure Quantum and then it will uh, send the results back to you. And now you can see that I have a histogram. It's a JSON object that describes a histogram where it says that item one and item two, so it looks like a .NET tuple, <laughs> um, is zero, zero, 25% of the time and one, one, 75% of the time. And this is that entanglement. I have two qubits and they are both zero in 25% of the time and both one in 75% of the time, but never are they zero one or one zero because they are entangled. So they will always be the same, but the distribution of being the same is 25, 75%. Uh, so this is how you run quantum algorithms on an actual physical quantum computer. And then finally, before I finish, there's one more thing, and that's this quantum-inspired optimization. It's actually something completely different. It's uh, it's not related to Q Sharp specifically. Basically, Microsoft um, has learned, and uh, people in general have learned from all of this quantum uh, hype, and we are creating optimization um, helpers that can use us with that can help us with optimization problems. So when you have an optimization problem in your line of business application, you don't really have to go to quantum immediately. You can use this quantum inspired optimization to already help you with that. And I have a very cool example from Microsoft um, that is using Python. Um, it's using Python. And in this Python problem, the problem that I basically have is that I want to put containers on ships, but I want to have an optimi optimized distribution of containers on these two ships. It's a very easy problem, um, but if that problem becomes more complex, it becomes very hard to solve for classical computers. With quant quantum inspired optimization, that can already help us um, a lot because Microsoft has created specific hardware that is optimized to, to work on these kinds of problems. And so, for example, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten containers, which have some arbitrary weight that has one, five, nine, 21, I don't know, maybe it's tons, maybe it's something different, kilograms, whatever, doesn't really matter, but I have 10 containers. I am creating terms for this problem, um, put all, putting all of these values in, in terms, and I'm going to use um, parallel tempering, which is a, a kind of optimization um, algorithm that I can use for optimization problems. And now I'm going to send this to my Azure Quantum Workspace to be solved by this quantum-inspired optimization uh, hard, hardware. 
Um, and then when my solver has optimized that problem, I get a result and I can print the result to my console. And basically it's, it's all the combinations. Eh? Just make all of the combinations of these containers and see how you can distribute the weight uh, evenly in these two containers. And in the beginning of this file, I'm declaring an Azure workspace by using its full resource identifier, which is my Azure quantum workspace. And I can just use Python um, to run this Python code file uh, and it will connect to Azure Quantum and it will try to optimize this problem. So if you, again, the question before, are you going to use Quantum in your business line application, um, line of business application, I'm sorry. Um, probably not yet, maybe in 10 years or in five years, um, if you are very bleeding edge. Um, but this is something that you can already use if you have optimization problems, for example. It's quantum inspired. It's not yet running on real quantum hardware, but we can get there step by step. And so it says that different containers are placed on ships A and B. And at the end, ship A weighs 52 tons and ship B weighs 53 tons. So it's, uh, it's distributed quite evenly. So that's what Q Sharp looks like in a nutshell. This is what Azure Quantum can help you with in another nutshell. Um, back to my slides. Uh, again, as I told you, I'm very sorry. Um, I really wanted to show you the CHSH game, but I don't have any more time. Um, if you are really, really interested in this quantum stuff and you want to know more about it, please look into the CHSH game. It's a very cool concept. It will blow your mind um, in multiple different ways. I have tried to put it in my slides. It's probably not going to be enough for you to comprehend because it has all kinds of circles and mathematics and stuff like that. But this really helped me to, uh, helped me to understand, okay, now I, I, I think I start to, to understand if you just create an algorithm very cleverly, by just being very clever with these superposition states, you can actually increase probabilities to your advantage. Uh, and basically that's the only thing I'm going to say about this. The CHSH game is kind of a game that can be played by two people that cannot communicate to each other. And both of these people, Alice and Bob, they will get input and they need, they need to provide output. And based on the input and the output combined, they have a probability to win the game. Um, and uh, the formula is in the, is in the bottom here. Uh, X times Y needs to equal A, um, exclusive or B. Um, and in a classical way, world where, where these two people cannot communicate to each other, um, basically when you, sorry, when you look at this uh, th truth table stuff, when both of them, um, that's not the correct one, sorry. When both of them answer uh, zero or one, they have a 75% chance of winning the game. So the, the, the maximum chance of winning the game is 75%, which is already quite a high number, but it's 75% nonetheless. Um, if we translate this into a quantum world and we, we look at all the four different scenarios where X comes in and Alice uh, outputs one or zero and Y comes in and Bob an uh, answers one or zero. So there's four different scenarios. If I look at all of those four different scenarios and I draw whatever happens with entangled qubits in these circle diagrams, the probability always outputs to 85%. So in the quantum world, Alice and Bob have 85% chance of winning this game, which is a higher probability. So they will, if this was just betting and money was involved, they would have a higher chance of winning lots of money when they would do it in a quantum way. Again, a very cool concept that is, it's not really usable in, 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 in practice, but it, it helps us to understand how quantum can help us to increase this probability, this chance of winning this game. So in, 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 in turn, be more powerful uh, and we can really use that in our advantage or to our advantage. Um, and with that, uh, I'm at the end of my presentation. I was six minutes over time, very sorry for that. Um, did, again, there's many of these examples on my GitHub page. Um, this is the link and this is the QR code. Uh, tonight, I will also make a copy of this presentation uh, and I will also put that inside of that uh, GitHub repository so you can also have a look at the presentation itself. And if you look at my GitHub page, 
you will see that I have multiple examples, uh, superposition, entanglement, teleportation, Deutsch is another algorithm that I didn't even talk about. This is the complete implementation for the CHSH game. This is Azure Quantum with IonQ, the example that I showed you, and this is the Azure Quantum in Python with the quantum inspired optimization example that I showed you. And then my slides will also be added to this. So again, with that, I'm at the end finally maybe for some people and i will look at um the questions in slido are there any new questions i basically need to say that some of them are answered so how does someone with software engineering but no quantum computing experience break into the quantum computing field and work on quantum computing during the day job well that's a that's a bit of a hard question um, and I'm, I'm, I have the same uh, problem with that. Uh, I am a .NET developer with an interest to quantum computing, but today in my field, I didn't yet have an opportunity to see, okay, this is something where quantum computing could, could really help me because I'm, I'm not really working on medical stuff. I'm not working on very complex algorithms. I'm like the, the, the architect kind of developer that creates um distributed system and microservices systems for CRUD applications for for customers basically um but there are other fields and i know this from experience because i i also try to be uh present in the belgian uh, quantum community and i've been to a community event uh, a couple of months ago where kbc the kbc the the belgian uh, bank uh, was also uh, was also there, and they were already experimenting with quantum to um, to help them figure out insurance policies and personalized insurance policies, because an insurance policy for a bank is something today that is not very personalized. They have like a, a couple of different scenarios, and they calculate based on these scenarios how much money they need to ask from their customers in in order to to not uh, bite themselves in the foot. Uh, they don't want to lose money when they need to pay for for insurance. They they really need to, to do some calculations on, on based on that. But it seems that people really want to have personalized insurance policies. That means that based on your personal uh, situation, uh, if you, if you are a smoker, if you have spe specific diseases or whatever, this is also something that is that is a little bit in a gray zone, of course. But uh, they really want to create insurance policies very specific to people, but that means that there are so many variables introduced and when they need to do all of their calculations with so many variables, the problem becomes too complex. And that's the same story as I tried to tell you before. Um, same story as I told you before is that when a problem becomes too complex, we need too much processing power. We cannot handle it. The problem becomes exponentially complex. I think about traveling salesmen and stuff like that. Um, so they are really looking into quantum computing with a team to create algorithms that can help them specifically. So that is something that you could probably do when you apply for a job with a bank to help them to look into, okay, can quantum computing in the near future help us to solve these kinds of problems? And I guess in the medical world, it's going to be the same thing in the uh, machine world, machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence world. It can also be something that can be investigated. But again, physically, we are still in a very early phase. We are still experimenting um, and we can solve small problems. Uh, but we are not able yet to solve larger problems that, that, are, that can be really useful. And by the way, this is what all of that um, quantum supremacy is about. Uh, you, you, you hear uh, in the media stuff about quantum supremacy. Uh, and quantum supremacy, supremacy basically means when you, we create a quantum computer that can solve a problem that is not solvable by a classical computer or it can solve it significantly faster. The algorithms that we have today and the physical implementations of that, they, they are able to solve problems twice as fast or even 10 times as fast uh, in theory, but not exponentially as fast, like not a thousand times as fast. So, so we have not yet reached quantum supremacy uh, and we are still working to work towards that. Uh, and sometimes I like Google, uh, I think last year or even the year before, I can't remember, they 
declared a, or they wrote a paper like we have achieved quantum supremacy uh, because we have a, a very specific classical algorithm and we have we translated that into a quantum algorithm and the quantum algorithm is significantly significantly faster but then another team from another company said okay we looked at your at your paper um, but we decided that the, the the original classical algorithm that you wrote we can actually optimize that in a in a, in a classical world um, where it also runs a lot faster. So it's it's really it's really an ex an experiment that we need to do. It's really uh, investigating if there is if there is really a classical algorithm that we cannot optimize any further, where a quantum counterpart can be a lot more performance. Uh, so we we have yet yet to find a solution for that. And if you look into algorithms like Shor's algorithm and and Grover's algorithm, those algorithms in th theory can give us an exponential benefit, but we don't have the physical hardware that has enough qubits to achieve that. The algorithms exist, but we cannot run them on hardware that has enough qubits. It's not possible today. So we really need to wait until the, the hardware is powerful enough. Um, are there any other questions? How do we do Q-sharp unit testing? Well, basically Q-sharp unit testing um, today is more in the field of you trying to learn about unit testing. I didn't really have the time to talk about this, but Q-sharp is so much more than just uh, simulating on your local environment. Um, the simulator that Q-sharp runs on can help us to run our algorithm like it should run on an actual quantum computer. It supports all of the different gates and all of the operations that we in theory defined for the universal quantum computer. And the universal quantum computer is that theory that I talked to you about that's already 30 years old. Um, Q-sharp is compatible with the universal quantum computer. You can do whatever you want uh, in Q-sharp that is possible in a universal quantum uh, computer uh, concept. There are also uh, like IBM's quantum computers and ION-Q, uh, Q's like QCI's quantum computers do most of the stuff from a universal quantum computing aspect. They support most of that stuff. Um, but that makes that running quantum programs on your local computer becomes very difficult if you need, in my case, more than 27 qubits. Um, but Microsoft provides multiple of these simulators and you can basically change simulators by just putting an attribute on top of your um, of your code or by using command line arguments in your .NET run, you can create your own simulators. And some simulators only support very specific gates and they leave out other gates by creating a subset of the universal quantum computer. And if you create a subset of this, you can do all kinds of testing and you can use more qubits. And Microsoft also uh, supports resource estimation. And resource estimation is a, is a kind of simulator that does not really run your, your quantum algorithm, but it investigates your quantum algorithm and tries to um, suggest how much resources you would need for, from a quantum computer to actually run your, arg, uh, run your program so that you can optimize your program. Uh, if it says you need 1000 qubits, you can try to optimize it to use less qubits, for example. And this, this points into the direction of why would you do unit testing? With unit testing in a simulated environment, you can really start to uh, fiddle around with the state of qubits because on a, if you don't think about what you're doing in that mathematical way, it's very hard to predict what is happening to your quantum states. If you are starting to combine quantum states with multiple qubits and you entangle qubits and you put qubits through, through gates, this state will do all kinds of funky things. And on a physical quantum computing, computer, you cannot debug. It's not possible. Um, you, once you measure, like the debugger in C-sharp, for example, you look at the value of a variable forbidden in a, quantum world because when the moment you look at it you destroy your complete quantum state because then all of your states start to collapse to either zero or one and you lose whatever thing whatever interesting thing that was happening so it's very difficult so that's why on a, an, an, a simulated environment with whatever simulator you're trying to use you can use unit testing to really look into the state of a of a, of a qubit if i do this and this and this operation i expect for one qubit that my state will be some somewhere in between this this uh, probability and this probability as unit tests can really help you with trying to create parts of your algorithm 
uh, and to test parts of your algorithm that you are able to test on your local machine. Uh, and that's what a unit test is all about. It tests small units of your application. And then when you throw everything together, um, the only thing in a quantum world that you can do is run it on a physical quantum computer and hope for the best. Um, there's, of, of course, there's no way of doing integration testing uh, when you put everything together for your for your algorithm on your local machine because you don't have enough resources. You, you really need to run it on a quantum computer and fingers crossed that nothing uh, blows up. Uh, but that's how unit testing can help you with that. Uh, what else do we have? How do we debug Q Sharp application bugs? I think I answered that question. For actual quantum computers, that's going to be a very difficult thing, uh, and I guess that that is down to um, down to uh, phys physical quantum computer manufacturers to add some kind of logging to their machines that they can really tell you, okay, this qubit has has been through this. Um, gate and this gate and this gate and this happened and that went wrong and this went right um, but but really look looking at states in a running application is a no-go something we cannot do in a quantum computer we can do it in a simulated environment with only units of our application by using unit tests and debugging by the way debugging is supported in q sharp you can put breakpoints you can look at qubit states and it will tell you the probabilities it will tell you those percentages so it's very cool to learn from again Q Sharp is a very cool language to learn from. So please, if you're interested, uh, take a look in. And Microsoft has lots of documentation, lots of examples and courses and whatever to help you to try to understand Q Sharp. All right. I think there's no more questions. Um, nope. Yeah, I think um, yeah, I think that's about it, man. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Thank, thanks for that, Johnny. That was. Um, yeah, man, that, that was great. I know we ran over a little bit, but uh, I mean, I've been listening for uh, for the whole time, and you know, I think me and a lot of other people uh, have had their have their minds blown as uh, they've put in their put in the comment section. So um, yeah, so yeah, of course. Uh, no, go, 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 go ahead, Luke. I was just going to say, um, I think you put your socials towards the beginning of this video, but um, how, how did the people reach you after this? Yeah, let me just show that slide one more time. So. Uh, let's go back, 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 back. Again, yeah, I think uh, Twitter, GitHub, or my professional email address, uh, you can reach me and I will try my best to answer your questions or help you even if you have, a, if you have any issues with learning 